Okay, so now we're going to put all the things we've learned about in the previous lessons together and talk about primary productivity, trophic levels, energy flow, food chains, and food webs. So you'll notice that our big idea has changed. Now we're going to talk about energy conversions and how energy flows through ecosystems and how it becomes more unusable at each step. So our enduring understanding is that energy can be converted from one form to another. So we're going to start with 1.8. So by the end of this lesson, you should be able to explain how solar energy is acquired and transferred by living organisms. To accomplish this, we will describe primary productivity, describe the difference between GPP and NPP, and explain how NPP relates to different ecosystems. So we've talked a lot about how the temperature and the precipitation impacts the biome. So what happens to all that sunlight when it gets absorbed by a plant? What does that mean for the different ecosystems? So we know that sunlight gets converted into glucose in plants through a process called photosynthesis. And we've termed this whole process primary productivity, which is the rate at which the solar energy, the sunlight, is converted into organic compounds, the glucose, you have photosynthesis over some period of time. So basically, it's a measure of how much photosynthesis is going on in a given area. So we call that the gross primary productivity. All that sunlight getting converted into glucose is the GPP, gross primary productivity. So sunlight goes in, glucose comes out, that's our GPP. That includes everything. But that is not a good measure of how much productivity there is in an ecosystem. Because some of that gets used for the plant's own cellular respiration. So it's not actually available to any of the animals that eat it. So we have to factor that in and we have something called net primary productivity, which is what's left over after we account for the plant's own cellular respiration. So there's a formula for this. It's that the net primary productivity, the NPP, is equal to the gross primary productivity minus the cellular respiration. So think of it like plant tax. You have a gross amount of product, but the plant takes its own tax to feed itself. What you have left over is the net. So same with your paycheck. You get a gross amount of pay, then you get taxed. You only really get to spend the net. And this is measured in units of energy per unit area per unit time. So for example, that could be kilocalories per meter squared per year. It could be grams of carbon per meter squared per year. So here's an example. The gross primary productivity of an ecosystem is 3.5 kilograms of carbon per meter squared per year. And the energy needed by the producers for their own respiration, so there's the cellular respiration, is 3 kilograms per meter squared per year. What is the net primary productivity of such an ecosystem? So if you set up your equation, we have the gross primary productivity right here. And we're subtracting out three. Not a very good circle drawer on the laptop. And what do we have left over? We should get 3.5 3 minus 3 gives us 0.5 kilograms carbon per meter squared per year. Okay, so what does this mean for the ecosystems, this NPP? So NPP fuels the whole rest of the food chain. You have less NPP, less fuel. More NPP, more fuel. So let's look at this in relation to the biomes. So we see up here that our tropical rainforest is very high. Remember we talked about the biodiversity in the coral reefs? So, and we also talked about the swamps, the marsh, and the estuaries having high amounts of biodiversity, where we mentioned that the ocean, is open ocean, is like a desert, and we've got the actual desert, and our extreme desert, like the tundra. So NPP is higher here, right? 
more plants, more NPP into your system, more biodiversity in the animals. Less plants, less NPP, less biodiversity in the system. So NPP impacts the species richness and the biodiversity. This is an important thing also in the ocean, because due to the limited distance that the light can penetrate, the photosynthesizers, the organisms down there that are converting the sunlight into usable product, have had to adapt to finding different ways. So if we look here, light only goes down at, at most in the very most perfect circumstances down to about 40 meters. That's not particularly very far. And we may get a little bit down to 200 meters, but you see most of it's just getting smaller and smaller in the open ocean, even less in the coastal waters. So where does all this NPP go? So you should be able to explain how energy flows and matter cycles through the trophic levels with these next couple lessons. We're going to do this by describing the flow of energy through an ecosystem, by explaining the first and second laws of thermodynamics, and explaining the relationship between species and an ecosystem. So let's start by looking at a food chain. So food chains are linear relationships. So they're in a straight line showing how animals are related by the food they eat. So we've got the corn, which is being eaten by the grasshopper, who's being eaten by this lizard, who's being eaten by this snake. And you'll notice that there's these arrows. The arrows show the flow of energy. So the available energy in the corn is getting given to the grasshopper, and then the grasshopper gives its energy to the lizard, and the lizard then gives its arrows to the snake. So that's a food web. I mean, a food chain, sorry. These get more complicated when we add in more species. So food webs are interlocking food chains, and they also show the flow of nutrients. So now we've added a mouse and an owl, which adds, you know, if we just looked here at the corn to the grasshopper, to the mouse, to the owl, we'd have a food uh, chain, but these are multiple food chains making a food web. So how are these organisms connected? What would happen if we got rid of this lizard? just got wiped out. All of them are gone one day. What happens to the rest of the food chain, these food webs? Well, first we'd see that the snake who relied on eating that lizard, their populations would start to go down because their food is gone. That's not great for the snake. But our grasshoppers are going to see an increase in their populations because they're no longer being eaten by lizards. That's pretty decent for the grasshopper. This also has a good benefit for the grasshopper mouse because he is also going to see an increase in population because they're not competing for the same food any further. And lastly, our corn is going to suffer because now there's more grasshoppers to eat it. So we have terms for all these organisms. We call the organisms that take the sunlight and convert it into glucose, the primary producers, so those are our plants. The organisms that directly eat the producers are called the primary consumers. The organisms that eat the primary consumers are our secondary consumers. And then we have our tertiary consumers, which may go a little bit higher in a more complex food web, but for the most part, we can only go so many links why is that? Because it relies on high quality energy. This is why the tropical rainforests can support more organisms because they have higher quality energy. So we have our first law of thermodynamics. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed. So what's missing from this energy pyramid is our decomposers breaking down decayed matter and the detritivores, which feed on the dead organisms, to cycle those nutrients. Remember, we just did our cycles on the nutrients, cycles them back into the food chain. So we've got our sun, 
hits our producers, and then moves up our energy pyramid. So you're going to see a term called biomass pop up a lot. Increasing biomass, decreasing biomass. Biomass is the dry weight of all organic matter of a given trophic level in a food chain or food web. So in this food, food web we have here, you may talk about the dry weight of the organic matter in the producers is more than the primary consumers. So why is that? Why is the energy biomass in the producers so much bigger than the rest? And this is because only 10% of the energy available in each trophic level can pass on to the consumer. So if producers make 10,000 kilocalories, the plants, the plant eaters can only access 10% or 1,000 kilocalories. And we've got a mouse eating this grasshopper. He can only access 1% of the energy or 100 kilocalories. And the snake who eats the mouse only gets 10 kilo kilocalories. 0.1% of the original plant's energy. And much of this energy is lost as heat. And this is our second law of thermodynamics. Whenever energy is transformed, there's a loss of energy through the release of heat. So to summarize this, it's kind of a big chunk of information. Primary productivity is a measure of photosynthesis. But the net prim primary productivity which is after we've taken out plant tax, is the energy that fuels an ecosystem. So we've got the energy that fuels the ecosystem, and now the energy from the sun is transferred to the primary producers, net primary productivity, and then to the consumers through a food chain or food web. The energy is transferred from organisms to organisms and back to the environment by detritivores or decom decomposers. Again, our first law of thermodynamics. Remember, it's shaped as a pyramid because only 10% of the energy available in each trophic level is actually able to be passed on to the next higher trophic level because much of that remaining energy is lost as heat. And that's our second law of thermodynamics.